I really enjoy working on all computers, whether they're old, new, or even bad. But if you've watched the channel for a while, you might have noticed that I kind of have a soft spot for little computers. So when I came across three of these Lenovo M715Q mini PCs on eBay, I couldn't help myself. So what can this little guy do? Let's find out. If you saw my previous video, you know that these three PCs were actually broken and being sold for parts, which really tempted me to see if I could get them up and running. And spoiler, I managed to at least get one working. If you want to know how the other two turned out, make sure to go check that video out now before I spoil anything else. But today, we're going to see what this system is capable of and where it might be useful. But what is this? Before I answer that, I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, these people. These are all of my patrons who pay at least a dollar a month to help make buying hardware like this possible. If you want to support the channel as well, you can head over to my Patreon where you can also get early access to videos, as well as some behind the scenes and bonus content. And all of the money I make from Patreon goes straight back into buying hardware or upgrades for the Hardware Haven channel. So thanks again to all of my patrons for helping to make this whole thing happen. The M715Q is a mini form factor from Lenovo featuring the 4-core 8-thread AMD Ryzen 5 Pro 2400GE, which could be confused with the 2400G. It is built on the same Zen 1 architecture, but has slightly lower clock speeds. However, this comes with the benefit of having only a 35W TDP compared to the 2400G's 65 watts. Granted, AMD's way of calculating TDP is a bit odd and not entirely useful, but this should still consume a bit less power out of the box while still providing four cores and eight threads. This APU features Vega 11 graphics, which aren't great, but should provide a bit of rendering horsepower and maybe even good hardware transcoding support. More on that later. This system comes with two 4GB sticks of DDR4 SOTA memory, but interestingly, the 2400GE, or at least the Pro 2400GE, is actually capable of running ECC memory. But I don't know if this motherboard is capable, and we're not going to be trying that out today. The M715Q has one 2.5 inch drive bay, as well as an M.2 slot for an NVMe drive, but these systems came with no storage. So I'm going to be adding in this team group 256GB NVMe SSD that I picked up for right around $20. Oh yeah, I probably should mention how much I paid for these. First of all, I paid $190 for all three systems, including shipping. And then I spent another $8 on a 4GB stick of RAM because one was faulty. I only had one power adapter, so I bought two more for about $20, and then another $60 to get three of the 256GB NVMe drives. So in total, I paid just shy of $280, or about $93 per system. The M715Q has a decent I.O., but nothing to write home about. With two DisplayPort adapters, a gigabit NIC, a few USB ports, and 3.5mm jacks for a mic and headphones. I got everything working in the last video, so all I really need to do in this one is get this system cleaned up, drop in the SSD, and add some fresh thermal paste while I'm at it.
After getting it all cleaned up and installing the SSD, I installed Windows 10 to start trying it out. Now I forgot to mention this in the script when I wrote it, but I remembered just now. When I installed Windows 10, I also updated the AMD drivers for the APU, and I also used Lenovo's BIOS flashing tool to make sure I updated the BIOS to the latest version. If you watched the repair video, you'll know that two of these systems, including the one I'm using right now, actually needed to be flashed with a new BIOS because the BIOS had been corrupted. And so there could be some weird stuff with serial numbers and UUIDs or something like that, but I was able to flash it to the latest BIOS and it even asked me if I wanted to update the serial number, which I did. So I think we're all good. It's running, it's working, so yeah. With the four Zen 1 cores, it was no surprise at all that using Windows and browsing the web was pretty snappy. But how well will this machine run some benchmarks? Well, I started off by running Cinebench R23, where it got a multi-threaded score of 3289. I also ran Cinebench R15 to make some comparisons to older systems I've tested in the past, and here it scored a 3 run average of 597. In PC Mark 10, it managed an essential score of 7,459, a productivity score of 6,766, and a content score of 3,631. It managed to do all of this while remaining relatively cool and efficient, drawing around 39 watts from the wall while under full load, and only 9 watts at idle. The CPU managed to stay relatively cool, only hitting a max packet temperature of 60 degrees Celsius, which was around 39C over ambient. Now these benchmarks and data points don't really mean anything on their own, so I found it interesting to compare this system to a couple of others I've looked at in the past. I chose to look at the Seed Odyssey, which has an Intel J4125 and 8GB of DDR4, as well as the Lenovo P310 with a Skylake E1275 V5 Xeon with 16GB of RAM and an NVIDIA Quadro K1200. The 4-core 8-thread Xeon walked away with a solid victory in both Cinebench R15 and 23, but surprisingly lost in all three categories of PC mark to the M715Q. It also clearly pulled a lot more power with 18 watts at idle and 94 under full load. The Odyssey was obviously the least power hungry of the three, only pulling 5 watts from the wall at idle and 17 under load, but managed relatively measly scores in Cinebench. The M715Q with the R5 Pro 2400GE was a really good middle ground, at least in this specific comparison, putting up respectable performance while only idling at 4 watts higher than the Odyssey. Now, I didn't install Linux on this, and, and wait, wait, I know you're already typing out there about how Windows is trash and I need to use, I know, breathe, it's okay. I love Linux, I think it's great, but I didn't really imagine installing a Linux distro would really accomplish that much for this video, other than, hey, it did about the same as in Windows, but a little bit better. However, I do think this could be a cool little home server, especially with the integrated Vega GPUs hardware acceleration. So to put that to the test, I installed and set up Jellyfin to test out some transcoding. I got a little nervous at first because I couldn't quite get it to work, but then realized I was dumb and using the wrong file type. So when I actually used a 4K MP4 in my library, the Vega 11 was able to transcode down to a much lower bitrate and resolution in real time without breaking a sweat. So this box could be great for a little media server or something like that. You could either use the internal 2.5 inch bay to add an SSD or hard drive, or even add some sort of external hard drive storage via USB. And I know some people really don't like the idea of that, but I don't think a Plex or Jellyfin library is really that mission critical. A few years back, the 2400G was seen as a decent budget gaming APU that could get you started with esports titles and such before you had the budget to add in a dedicated GPU. So I thought it would be fun to put the Pro 2400GE to the test with a few games. I started off with Rocket League at 720p and the performance preset, and while I was basically locked at 60 frames per second, I was still getting a decent amount of stutter, as can be seen in the frame time graph. It wasn't terrible, and I would definitely say it was still playable, but this kinda made me not care to try out any other games. I imagine this system would be great for some 2D or light 3D casual games, but definitely not much else. While I was a bit disappointed with the gaming performance, I was pleasantly surprised when I tried streaming from my gaming PC with Parsec. I'm not sure why, but I wasn't expecting AMD's unified video decoder to be as good as it was, but it was good. 
I played Doom for a few minutes just because that's a game where latency is really important, and I swear, it felt like I was almost playing it on my gaming PC, not remotely. So while this isn't a great option for gaming necessarily, it could definitely be a good solution for streaming games to a living room TV or something, which is actually what I think I might use this for. And this gave me another idea. See, a while back, I set up an old Mac Mini as an emulator for some old Nintendo consoles. And while it was okay for things like NES or SNES, it would have been nice to do some GameCube or even PS2 emulation. I actually planned to do a video upgrading the CPU in that Apple Mac Mini, but accidentally killed it in the process, so whoops. But this might be my perfect solution, as it's tiny, efficient, and also works well for game streaming. So I tried putting it to the test with PCSX2. I can never, it's such a, such a bad name. Anyway, I tried putting it to the test with PCSX2, making sure to download the nightly build as that has support for Vulkan, which should give the AMD APU a fighting chance. I've had bad experiences, as have many others, with trying to emulate PS2 games, especially on lower end hardware, but the Vulkan API seems to really be the secret sauce for the Lenovo M715Q, as it handled the few games that I tried out very well. Some of them, like Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance and Need for Speed Most Wanted, only ran at a solid 60 frames per second when at native or just slightly over native resolution. But others, like MX Unleashed, were able to run at a solid 60 frames per second while at three times resolution, which is essentially equivalent to 1080p. I probably would have finished this video a lot sooner had I not been so distracted replaying some of the most formative games of my childhood. I was curious to try out some newer Nintendo consoles, like the Switch, but I enjoy not having copyright strikes on my channel. So what are my thoughts on this? Well, obviously I wouldn't buy this for gaming, let's just get that out of the way. I didn't test much in terms of productivity, but I don't think that this would be an optimal choice for most software if you're looking to do content creation and such. But for just about anything else, this seems like a pretty sweet machine, assuming you get one for a good price. With its relatively low power draw, small size, and hardware transcoding, it would work well for a little home server, especially for Plex or Jellyfin, as long as you don't need room for multiple hard drives. The CPU performance is pretty solid for most other home server tasks as well. You could even host something like a Minecraft server on here pretty easily. It's pretty good at emulation, at least for something as demanding as PCSX2, and also handles streaming really well. So as with just about anything, if this seems to suit your needs and you find one at a good price, I'd definitely say give it a shot. If you like this video, make sure to let me know by clicking the button. And if you'd like to see more like this, maybe consider subscribing. I do have three of these and I plan to do something fun with them in an upcoming video. So hopefully that's interesting. That's about it for this one though. So as always, thank you so much for watching, stay curious, and I really hope to see you in the next one.